Welcome to our presentation, Defense Experts, Assembling a Defense Team Without Reducing Your Fee. The emphasis will be on finding and funding expert witnesses. I'm Victor Vivier. My fellow presenter is my friend and co-author, Attorney Roger Lampkin. Learning objectives for this course. We hope this course teaches you the need for defense experts, how to find defense experts, and how to obtain funding for defense experts. This course is not meant to teach you appointment of experts in capital cases. That's often a very different procedure than we'll be teaching here. It's also not meant to teach you admissibility of expert testimony or objections to improper expert testimony. These types of information can be found in California Criminal Defense Motions and Limine, which is a book that was written by Mr. Lampkin and myself. About the presenters, I'm Victor Vivier. My name, email address, phone number are all on the presentation. Roger Lampkin. I am primarily a writer. I write for many attorneys. My education is I do have a Juris Doctorate and I passed the bar a few times, but I'm a writer. I've never been licensed to practice law. Roger Lampkin, on the other hand, is a licensed attorney. He's a very good trial attorney who has done hundreds, if not thousands of trials. Who can be an expert? The short answer is a person with special knowledge. Evidence Code 720A explains a person is qualified to testify as an expert if he has special knowledge, skill, training, or education sufficient to qualify him as an expert on the subject to which he, his testimony relates. In other words, it's just someone that has specialized knowledge that will help the jury understand some issue or something about the case. So what does an expert do? An expert gives an opinion. A fact witness tells what he sees, an expert tells what he thinks about it. Evidence Code 801 explains, if a witness is testifying as an expert, his testimony in the form of an opinion is limited to such an opinion as is related to a subject that is sufficiently beyond common experience that the opinion of an expert would assist the trier of fact, and based on matters including his special knowledge, skill, experience, training, and education, perceived by or personally known to the witness or made known to him at or before the hearing, whether or not admissible. That is, of a type that reasonably may be relied on by an expert in forming an opinion about the subject to which his testimony relates, unless an expert is precluded by law from using such matter as a basis for his opinion. In short, an expert uses his expertise to give an opinion. Examples of the difference between a fact witness and an expert witness. A fact witness may testify that a white substance was found in the defendant's pocket. An expert may give an opinion that the substance was methamphetamine. This opinion may be based on testing, may be based on visual, but it's an expert in the subject gives that opinion. A fact witness may say that defendant had pictures of himself with groups of men wearing all blue and making gestures with their hands. However, it takes an expert to give the opinion that defendant is a gang member based on that information and on the information already possessed by the expert. A fact witness may testify that fingerprints were found on the window. However, it takes an expert to give an opinion as to the meaning of that, so an expert may give the opinion that the fingerprints were left by defendant. A fact witness may testify that defendant's cell phone was seized. That doesn't really tell the jury a lot. However, after doing a proper examination, an expert witness may testify that location data from the cell phone placed defendant at the scene of the crime. The prosecution team may have many members, starting primarily with the investigators, who are the officers who perform the arrest and investigate the crime. Investigators are primarily fact witnesses, but the prosecution team may also include many, many types of experts. They may have a gang expert 
who can give an opinion that a defendant is a gang member and that the crime was committed for the purposes of the gang. This expert is typically another law enforcement officer. The prosecution may also have drug recognition experts, which could testify that the substance seen uh, was or appeared to be a drug or that the person appeared to be under the influence of a drug. The prosecution team may also include experts such as firearms experts who can testify to what a particular firearm, what type of weapon a particular firearm was, uh, what weapon particular shells came from, uh, or even what ballistic marks on bullets mean. An expert for the prosecution may also be a field sobriety test expert who performs gaze nystagmus or walk and turn or other field sobriety tests or exercises on a driver suspected of driving under the influence. A fingerprint examiner may testify that defendant's fingerprints uh, match the fingerprints that are found at a, a crime scene. These are typically all law enforcement officers who may also have other roles on the prosecution team. Uh, the prosecution may also have a phone and computer expert. Uh, very rarely will the prosecution expert have a lot of special expertise. Usually it's a law enforcement officer who learned from another law enforcement officer. A few have taken classes, but uh, I haven't seen any yet that have a, a bachelor's or higher education in computer science. Uh, up till this point, we were talking about primarily law enforcement officers serving as experts, but we also have some that are considered more experts by others, including medical doctors that may testify to injury or cause of death, DNA experts who can testify to uh, a match between DNA samples taken from a defendant and DNA samples found at the scene. And we also have various laboratory technicians that may testify to test results on ballistics, which can overlap with the firearms expert or uh, the uh, composition of drugs, uh, breath alcohol level, or other such matters. One person may have many roles in a case. A prosecution witness may appear in multiple roles, such as in a typical DUI case, where an officer appears both as a, wet, a fact witness and as an expert witness. Take, for example, Officer Bob. Officer Bob arrested and interrogated the defendant, so he testifies at trial as a fact witness. He testifies why he pulled the defendant over, what he saw after he pulled him over, uh, what he smelled. He uh, describes uh, what the defendant said and what defendant's demeanor was. However, Officer Bob can take on another role and testify as an expert as a field sobriety test expert. Uh, he can testify that he administered field sobriety exercises on the defendant, and then he can give an opinion that based on the outcome of those exercises, which Officer Bob will say were performed uh, incorrectly after Officer Bob gave the correct instructions, he will give an opinion that the defendant was under the influence based on the failed field sobriety tests. Officer Bob may also testify as a preliminary alcohol screening test expert. He will testify that he had a device called a preliminary alcohol screening test and that the device was calibrated correctly and administered correctly. And then he will give an opinion that defendant's breath had an alcohol level uh, sufficient to trigger the device at a possibly at a particular level or the court may limit him to an opinion that it detected alcohol. Officer Bob may also testify as an expert on the Drager alcohol test, which is an evidentiary breath test machine. He may testify that the machine was calibrated correctly, working correctly, and that he administered the test on defendant's breath and that it came up with a result of 0 0.09, 0 0.15, whatever the result was. These are opinions and Officer Bob is testifying as an opinion expert. Experts contribute to effective assistance of counsel. Effective assistance of counsel requires, when necessary, the allowance of investigative expenses or appointment of investigative assistance for indigent defendants in order to ensure effective preparation of their defense by their attorneys. Mason versus State of Arizona. 
a fundamental part of the constitutional right of an accused to be represented by counsel is that his attorney must be afforded reasonable opportunity to prepare for trial. To make such right effective, counsel is obviously entitled to the aid of such expert assistance as he may need in preparing the defense. Henry Oche. So this generally means that if an expert is going to make the case better, that the defense should at least investigate and get getting that expert. If the defense sees that the prosecution expert or investigator has made mistakes in the case, they need to get their own investigators and experts to impeach. So comparing to the DUI, if the defense challenges what the investigator said, then they need to get their own investigator to go out and see if there's videos, see if there's witnesses, interview them, and try to impeach the prosecution's investigation. The same thing goes for the field sobriety test expert. If a field sobriety test expert testified for the prosecution, the defense is generally entitled to one also if it will help in the defense. Same thing for the preliminary alcohol screening expert. Now, these experts may be the same person as it was in the prosecution's case, or it could be someone who uh, is specifically trained in field sobriety test or has operated the the PAS machine before. Same thing goes for the alcohol test expert. If someone is an expert on the alcohol test and can give favorable testimony to impeach the prosecution witnesses, then the defense should at a minimum consult that expert. These may be four different experts for the defense, or it may be one expert, possibly a former law enforcement officer who's experienced in all of these areas. But it is essential that the defense at least talk to and consult with such experts. So the question comes up, are defense experts really needed? Multiple cases have found that the failure to use expert witnesses is ineffective assistance of counsel. In Reheal Hill, expert metal testimony could have been used to refute molestation allegations. The court found that the defense's failure to secure a medical expert was ineffective. Henry Walker, expert testimony regarding intimate partner battering and its effects in a murder prosecution should have been brought in by a defense expert witness. It wasn't. The court found that it was ineffective. And as he the court was remanded for an evidentiary hearing to determine if there was a strategic reason that counsel did not call experts in a molestation case. In King, the defendant failed to call medical experts, and the court noted that a lawyer without medical training could not develop cross-examined questions cross-examination questions that would convincingly challenge state medical experts' opinions that the trauma to a victim's genitalia was most consistent with sexual assault. In Shell, the court found it ineffective that the defense did not consult with and retain a fingerprint expert when the only evidence linking the defendant to the crime was fingerprint evidence. In Sims, the court found that failure to hire ballistic experts to analyze bullet holes and powder patterns in a quilt that was held by a homicide victim was ineffective assistance of counsel. And then we have the Supreme Court weighing in on the issue in the matter of Hinton versus Alabama, and they took it a step further. They said that failure to replace an incompetent expert, uh, which was a firearms and tool mark expert tool mark evidence expert that the defense had already retained, failure to replace an expert once it's realized that that expert is incompetent is also an effective assistance of counsel. So in short, if an expert can help establish a defense, get an expert. If the prosecution has an expert, consider a comparable expert for the defense. An expert need not testify at trial to be of value. The expert just needs to give opinions and help the defense understand the case and be prepared to refute the prosecution case. Until now, we've been primarily talking about experts for the defense that are directly in response to prosecution experts, but I'd like to turn to another subject, hidden evidence and innovative uses of defense experts. In other words, taking a proactive approach and getting the types of experts that the prosecution doesn't normally use. For example, an eyewitness identification expert may be able to recreate the conditions of a crime scene and show that a victim could not have seen what he believes he saw.
It's difficult to imagine a situation where the prosecution would call an eyewitness identification expert to try to support an eyewitness identification, but the defense can call an eyewitness identification expert to refute the identification. Another innovative source of defense experts, Android phones are connected to Google location services. An expert could use the data from Google, even if the phone was not available, to help establish an alibi. Similarly, cell tower records may indicate that a defendant's, where a defendant's phone connected. An expert could use this data to also help establish an alibi or to show that the victim was not at the location that he or she claimed to be at the time of the alleged offense. Social media, Facebook, Snapchat, Instagram, Twitter, and other social media sites can provide a wealth of information about a defendant's or a witness's location, contacts, habits, thoughts, and conversations. A technology expert could extract this data for use by the defense, such as the alleged victim told police one story but posted another story on social media. This is fairly common to post stories about what happened on social media. The alleged victim was angry that the defendant was seeing someone else. Uh, people often rant on social media about how they've been done wrong, and this could provide motive for an alleged victim to lie. The alleged victim was a drug user. It's common for Facebook, Snapchat, other social media to show drug use and drug paraphernalia. Uh, people don't seem to be uh, too interested in hiding their sins. The alleged victim was at a different location than defendant at the time of the alleged crime. Again, Facebook and a lot of the other social media keeps location data, which can be used to show that the defendant was not at the scene of the crime or the alleged victim was not at the scene of the crime. Often cases will suffer from bad facts, and often these bad facts are developed by prosecution experts. Defense experts may not be able to refute these bad facts. However, good experts can help mitigate the bad facts. Take, for example, a bad fact. The defendant had a high blood alcohol level. The defense expert may not be able to refute this bad fact. However, the defense expert may be able to pick out mistakes made during the, during the blood draw, which could lead to reasonable doubt. Or consider the bad fact that defendant admitted to being a gang member. This bad fact may not be able to be refuted by a defense expert, but a defense expert may be able to help establish the crime was not committed for the benefit of the gang, which could be an element of the offense, thereby presenting again reasonable doubt. Or consider the bad fact that defendant's phone records place him at the crime scene. A defense expert may confirm that this is a reasonable interpretation of the data, or the defense expert may be able to point out mistakes in the way the data was extracted or give other theories as to what the data means. So consider a defense expert to help mitigate even if the defense expert is not able to refute the bad facts. Sometimes a case will suffer from bad facts found by a prosecution expert that cannot reasonably be refuted or mitigated by a defense expert. However, bad expert opinions can be good for the case. It's better to have a bad opinion than to be blindsided at trial. Take for example the bad fact, a bad finding by a defense expert. Defendant's computer contained additional incriminating evidence that the prosecution expert missed. This can still result in a good outcome. Settle the case prior to trial so the prosecution expert has no reason to continue reviewing evidence. Take, for example, the bad fact, a bad finding by a defense expert. Defendant is a gang member and the crime was committed for the benefit of the gang. A good outcome could be defendant develops a realistic expectation of his chances at trial and decides to settle. If both experts agree the defendant is a gang member and the crime was committed for the benefit of a gang, it's going to be very difficult to win at trial and hopefully the defendant will realize that and be realistic on settlement options. The banned finding by a defense expert, defendant's phone contains pictures from additional incidents of molestation. How can this be turned around? Well, a good outcome would be if the preliminary hearing was waived so that additional charges could not be added. So just because a case has a bad fact and the experts agree, what it actually means doesn't mean that the expert cannot be of value in the case.
So now that we know we want experts, the question is, where do we find them? How do we search for experts? So here's a simple step-by-step -step recommendation for finding experts if you don't already know who they are. First, chat with the clerk. Some jurisdictions have a panel of pre-approved investigators and experts, and some jurisdictions have a simplified procedure for appointment of those who have been pre-approved. As examples, Kern County has a list of pre-approved investigators for cases assigned to the Indian Defense Program, and Los Angeles County Superior Court has a list of pre-approved pre experts. Uh, the webpage link will be on the last page of this presentation. Many of the experts on the LA County list practice in other parts of the state also. So check with the expert, see if they practice in your jurisdiction and if they'll accept an appointment order in your jurisdiction. If you're not able to find an appropriate expert using the first step, move on to the second step. Check with the local bar association. Some local bar associations maintain a list of qualified experts. For example, the LA County Bar Association publishes such a list on their webpage. The link will be on the last page of this presentation so that you'll be able to just click on it. If you still aren't able to find an appropriate legal professional to serve as an expert, ask a friend. Odds are good that other legal professionals in your community have had similar expert witness issues and know which qualified experts are willing to accept appointment orders in your jurisdiction. The presenters have files on several dozen expert witnesses, so we're generally able to quickly locate an appropriate expert when needed. Step four, you may also be able to find an appropriate defense expert by using search engines such as Google, Bing, or DuckDuckGo. Search engines can be used to find experts, but the odds are good that the first few pages displayed will be for expert witness advertising services and not the actual experts. The more detailed the search, the higher the probability of finding an expert instead of a service. For example, searching prison gang expert California gives top results to Dan Vasquez and Dr. Jesse Delacruz. The presenters do not know Daniel Vasquez, but we've heard of him and his good reputation. We personally know and recommend Dr. Delacruz in appropriate cases. However, other qualified experts in this area, such as Daniel Folks and James Eston, do not appear in search engines early results, possibly because they are more qualified as prison experts than as internet experts. In short, internet searches may include, may exclude highly qualified experts or may lead to advertising sites instead of to the actual experts. So you have to be careful with the search engines. They're often going to lead you in the wrong direction and exclude some of the most highly qualified experts. Another way to find experts is through expert listing services, such as TASA Group, Juris Pro, American Medical Experts, SEEK, Expert Institute, or Expert Appointments. However, expert list sites may charge the experts for advertisements and may have their own procedures for expert appointments that are difficult to comply with and disfavored by the courts, such as advance fee payments. Such services are therefore listed as the last step in recommended ways to find an expert. However, we are in the early stages of trying to set up our own expert list site to share information about experts we know, but even our site should be considered under the same scrutiny and only after exhausting the other efforts. Ours is expertappointments.com. So now that you found your expert, he needs to be funded. Does the attorney have to pay for the expert? The answer is a resounding no. So let's discuss five different ways that an expert witness for the defense can be paid, or as we put it, five funding fines. The first one, of course, is paid for by the attorney. However, you're not the defendant's mommy. You're not the bank. It's not your job to pay for the expenses of an expert for an indigent defendant. 
or any defendant for that matter. So we're going to just spark that one out. The second method is private pay. If the client is not indigent, he may be required to pay the expenses of his own experts. Next, we'll talk about pre-funded cases, such as cases with the public defender or with an indigent defense panel. And then we'll talk about cases where the attorney is retained, but the defendant remains indigent. And finally, we'll talk about the attorneys appointed for an indigent defendant. We won't talk much about private pay because it's rather simple. A defendant with adequate resources may be required to pay the cost of investigators and experts. Court funding is only for the indigent. So in other words, if the client has money, the client's probably going to be required to retain and pay for their own experts and investigators. Pre-funded experts and investigators. The need for services from some experts is so common that funding may already be in place. For example, public defenders often have investigators on staff and a budget reserved for other experts. Alternate defense panels often have investigators on the panel, and sometimes they also have other experts, paralegals, interpreters, and secretarial staff on panel. Courts often have mental health professionals pre-funded for competency, not guilty by reason of insanity, and related proceedings. However, some such appointments are not confidential, such as competency and not guilty by reason of insanity are generally not confidential unless the attorney requests a confidential appointment of someone on the panel specifically to advise the defense and not to render the NGI opinion for the benefit of the court or the competency opinion for the benefit of the court. Turning now to the first of two primary areas of funding for experts that we wish to present in this course, where the attorney is retained, but the defendant is indigent. The first question that comes up has already been presented to a court, which is, may a trial court appoint experts at county expense for an indigent defendant represented by private counsel? The court in the matter of People versus Worthy asked this very question, and the court answered, if a criminal defendant requires the services of investigators or scientific or medical experts to assist him in preparation of his defense, that assistance must be provided whether it is paid for by the government or by the defendant depends solely on the defendant's economic status. So in short, even if the attorney is privately retained, if it can be shown that the defendant is indigent, the county still must pay for necessary investigators and experts. Turning to our last category of funding, attorney appointed for an indigent defendant. This procedure is much the same as where the attorney is retained for an indigent defendant. Either way, it's done through what's called an ex parte application for funds or an ex parte request for funds. And now we'll concentrate on the actual application for funds. Ex parte request for appointment. An ex parte request is used to obtain funds and secure appointment of experts and investigators for indigent defendants, whether the attorney is retained or appointed. Parts of the request packet include, one, the request, a signed statement of what is requested, Two, points and authorities. Different authority applies to retain cases and appointed cases. Three, declaration of counsel. Four, proposed order. This should generally be the last page in the packet with a flag marking where the judge should sign. And five, possible exhibits. A, a possible exhibit is an expert CV. If the expert is unknown to the court, a curriculum vitae, resume, or statement of qualifications may be required. Of course, if this is an expert that's regularly appointed by the court and the court is aware of the expert's qualifications, this may not be needed. But if it's a new expert or someone unknown to the court, adequate exhibits should be attached to explain the expert's qualifications. B, a declaration of defendant. If defendant's indigency indigency is in question, he should explain his financial situa situation in a declaration. 
the burden is on the defense to establish that the defendant is indigent. Often this is fairly easy to do just by pointing out that the defendant is in custody, has no assets, and has no income. C. Police reports. If the need for the expert can be demonstrated by police reports, applicable pages from the reports should be attached, such as a report indicating fingerprint examiner Jones conducted a comparison, or that an expert performed field sobriety tests on the defendant, or that DNA tests linked defendant to the crime scene. If the police report mentions the type of expert that is needed, then it's often helpful to attach the actual police report. Another common area where it's helpful to attach the police report is if it mentions that uh, 20 discs have been seized and are being produced in discovery, or that the cell phone was seized and will be produced in discovery. Uh, it helps show the need for the expert, so those attachments uh, should be added to the request. The first part of the request packet, which should always be the first page of the request packet, is the actual request. It's addressed solely to the court because this is an ex parte. The prosecution should not be given any notice of the request. And it's in simple terms, it asks the court for appointment of an expert and explains that the expert is necessary to preparation of the defense and that it's based on the request and all attached documents. The next part of the request packet is the memorandum of points and authorities. The sample pleadings are linked at the end of this presentation. However, for now, we're going to break the points and authorities down into separate parts. The first is the general authority for appointment of experts. And this is fairly long. I'll just leave it up on the screen and give you a little time to read it. The next part of the points and authorities is the authority for maintaining confidentiality of experts and expert communications. Experts become members of the defense team and therefore all of their communications with the defendant, with the attorney, and with each other are protected. So I'll give you a little time to read the authority for the proposition that the experts are confidential and should remain confidential. The next section of the points and authorities is needed only when the attorney is privately retained. The additional authority when counsel is privately retained basically says that a defendant establishes entitlement to an appointment of experts by showing that he is personally indigent and that the requested services are reasonably necessary to the preparation of a defense. And I'll give you a moment to read the rest of the authority. On a retained case, an attorney should generally expect to pay the normal cost of overhead for paralegals and secretaries. However, on an appointed case, paralegals and secretaries are generally authorized by the court and courts have recognized that they're necessary support services for attorneys. This is especially true when there are cases that require a paralegal to do repetitive tasks. 
For example, jail calls and recorded jail visits. Some defendants have many, many jail calls and many, many recorded jail visits, totaling hundreds of hours. It is not efficient for an attorney to listen to all of those calls and recordings, typically at a much higher rate than the paralegal would charge. The same holds true for prison mental health records. A defendant who has been in prison for a long time before reoffending may have 10 or 15 years of mental health records comprising thousands, if not tens of thousands of pages. And often those pages must be reviewed just to find mental health issues related to a not guilty plea or past interactions with the same victim. Body camera videos are also something that paralegals can watch and save money for the county and save the attorney lots of time because at a typical crime scene with multiple officers, each one will have their body camera on, but very few of them will actually catch anything relative to the case. Often they're just walking around, you'll see them driving their car, filling out paperwork, but it doesn't show anything that's beneficial to the case. A paralegal can watch all of those videos and narrow it down and call the attorney's attention to something that might be important. The same is true for MVARs, which are mobile video audio recording systems. In a fairly recent case, there was a car chase that lasted almost an hour because once the car stopped, it took a long time for other vehicles to come and extract the defendants from the car. So we had three vehicles, each with an hour long video recording. And frankly, there was nothing really relevant on it, except when the defendants actually got out of the car. Security system videos are another area that paralegals should be able to handle. Uh, often security system and commercial uh, establishments, retailers have 16 or more channels and they are produced in one hour increments. So a short incident inside a store may produce 32 individual recordings, each lasting an hour. However, only a small portion of those will be relevant to a case and it would be a waste of county money and a waste of the attorney's time to watch all of those videos from start to finish just for a small portion that's relative. Therefore, the courts encourage the use of paralegals and secretaries to do such mundane tasks. And I'll give you a few moments to read the authority behind it. Additional authority is also provided for when the requested expert is an interpreter. The need arises for an interpreter because many courts have courtroom interpreters and some judges expect the interpreter to serve for all defendants in the courtroom, all witnesses in the courtroom, all attorneys in the courtroom, but this simply isn't the law. A defendant is entitled to an interpreter just for that defendant, not to be shared amongst everyone else. If the interpreter is shared amongst everyone, there's a great danger that the interpreter is actually going to accidentally going to say something or somehow reveal a confidence of one of the other defendants. So this shouldn't happen. There's authority specifically for appointment of an interpreter for the defendant, both in and out of court. So I'll pause for a moment so that you can read the specific authority that we provide for interpreters. The most important and most difficult to write part of a packet for ex parte appointment of expert is the declaration. Most of the rest of the ex parte packet is pre-written. It's standard points and authorities and standard language, but the declaration is very case specific. So we're not providing an example here. Instead, we're going to talk about what needs to be in the declaration. On a retained case, there's generally five parts to the declaration. The first part is that the expert is necessary. To show that the expert is ne necessary often requires pointing out that the prosecution has an expert in a given area, and therefore the defense needs an expert to refute. For example, 
I am informed to believe that the prosecution has two gang experts who will be testifying at trial. Therefore, I need appointment of a gang expert to refute the testimony of the prosecution's gang experts. Or I'm informed and believe that the prosecution seized cell phones in this case and intends to have the cell phones examined by prosecution experts. Therefore, I need a defense expert to review the work of the prosecution expert and be prepared to testify at trial should he find discrepancies in the prosecution expert's work. The next part is that the expert is qualified. This may be a simple statement of qualifications, or it may require attachment of a CV, a resume, or other documentation showing that the expert is qualified to do the scope of work requested. The third part is that the expert fees are reasonable. If the fees aren't too high, it can be just a simple statement that this appears to be typically what is charged in the market. If the fees seem high, you may need to compare to other experts in the field using lists such as the Los Angeles County Superior Court list of pre-approved experts. The fourth part is proof that the defendant is indigent. It may be a, a simple statement that I'm informed and believe that defendant is indigent and that he is in custody, unemployed, and has no appreciable assets. The last part is that the attorney's fees are not excessive. This is generally established simply by pointing out that the fees were paid by a third party and very often the case is that the attorney has not been paid his full retainer. The declaration in support of ex parte request for funds for expert on an appointed case is only slightly different. It's still the most important part of an ex parte request for expert, but there's a few minor differences. The fact that the expert is necessary is the same on both. It's also the same that you must establish that the expert is qualified and you must establish in the declaration that the expert fees are reasonable. However, when it comes to the defendant's indigency, you need a simple statement that just says that the court has previously determined that defendant is indigent. Had the court not made this finding, then you probably would not have been appointed on the case. And the final part is that the attorney has been appointed to represent the defendant. The very last page of the request packet is the order. The order is generally fairly standard language, which is shown on the screen. Some courts may have specific items that they want included in the order, such as upon a finding that defendant is indigent or uh, other language uh, that may be found in local rules. Now that you've prepared your packet requesting funding for an expert, how do you file it? Unfortunately, that answer is it depends. Each jurisdiction has its own procedures, but an ex parte request along with a copy of the request should generally be filed in one of four places. With the ex parte clerk, this is often a designated clerk in the felony department of the court, in the presiding department, with the judicial secretary, or in the trial court. If trial is underway, the request will usually be filed with the trial judge. Check your local rules or ask a clerk where to file the request. Often they're filed in one place and then forwarded to the presiding department, but make sure that you file it in the correct place and make sure that you put it in an envelope to maintain confidentiality. The outside of the envelope generally should have the attorney's name on it and just to note that it is an ex parte request. Most courts do not require that the outside of the envelope identify the actual defendant or the actual case number. Ex parte requests are confidential. However, there are some typical ways that that confidentiality is broken and that the prosecution finds out about who the experts are and what the experts are up to. Therefore, we'd briefly like to talk about keeping secrets. 
how to protect expert information. First, do not identify the expert or the expert's area of expertise in the case caption. The case caption for an ex parte request is often entered into the California Justice Information Services computer system, CJIS typically, or other systems that the prosecution is able to view. A typical CJIS entry might therefore be defendant's request to appoint Alfonso Rivera as cell phone expert, confidential. Such an entry violates confidentiality. The case caption should therefore be generic. It should simply say ex parte request. That way, if someone looks at CJIS, instead of identifying the name of the expert and their area of expertise, it will simply say that it's an ex parte request. Leave it a mystery. Do not allow the experts to con contact the prosecution. Consider this hypothetical phone call to the district attorney. Hello, this is Jane James from Firearm Forensic Fellowship. I'd like to make arrangements to view the firearm in People vs. Fiverr case. Discuss confidentiality with your experts and make sure they protect it. If the expert needs to view a firearm in a particular case, the expert can typically go along with the investigator and need not identify himself or his area of expertise. Do not send an ex parte request without a confidential envelope. An ex parte request should be submitted in an envelope marked ex parte and confidential. If a request is sent without being inside such an envelope, anyone handling it can have a glance at it. Also, beware of requests that are not truly confidential. Some appointments, such as mental health professionals to determine competency and not guilty by reason of insanity, are not confidential. You can request appointment of a doctor to specifically assist the defense and only the defense and request that it be a confidential order. However, a general appointment order on an NGI case or on a 1368 not competent to stand trial case is not confidential. Also, beware, be aware of jail visits. Jail visit logs are generally available to the prosecution, so they can look up and see what experts are visiting the defendant. This is especially bad in cases involving, for example, a gang expert, because if the gang expert goes out and interviews the defendant, he may also testify to statements that the defendant made, thereby violating the defendant's Fifth Amendment right against self-incrimination. So make sure that first that the expert only goes out to the jail if absolutely needed, and second, that if he goes out, uh, he has to be aware that it's disclosing his identity to the prosecution. Some may think that disclosure of the identity of a defense expert may not be all that important because after all, the expert's identity is probably going to be disclosed eventually if the case goes all the way to trial. However, that idea might be somewhat wrong. Accidental disclosure of expert information can be devastating to the defense because it can reveal defense strategies and give the prosecution opportunity to adjust their case. Sad examples include, in a case where the prosecution did not produce DNA evidence, the defense requested a DNA expert. The prosecution realized that the defense intended to argue that the lack of DNA at the scene meant that the defendant was not there, so the prosecution conducted its own DNA testing. Defendant's DNA was found on a hat at the crime scene. This was significantly incriminating evidence that would have never come up if the, if the expert's identity had not been revealed. Another example, the defense requested appointment of an eyewitness identification expert to explain defects in a lineup. The prosecution responded by requesting a new lineup. In the new lineup, the uh, witness was able to identify the defendant and made the identification with absolute certainty at that point. The final example. The defendant requested appointment of a fingerprint expert to challenge an identification based on a single partial print. The prosecution responded by conducting DNA evidence and they found the defendant's DNA. So uh, the defense almost helped the prosecution build their case. We hope this presentation has given you enough information and tools to build a good defense team. 
including necessary experts such as cell phone experts, gang experts, and investigators. The defense team, of course, is led by you, the attorney, the hero. Review of handouts, questions and answers, and discussions. Links and handouts related to this presentation are found at 661justice.com slash experts. If you are viewing the live presentation of this, then Mr. Lampkin should be passing out the handouts right now, and we'll be discussing them with you. If you're watching the pre-recorded version of this, then we're going to try to interview a few experts and find out what they think about this procedure and what they can do for you. Thanks for watching. Okay, I am interviewing Dr. Jesse Dela Cruz. Welcome, Dr. Dela Cruz. Could you briefly describe or briefly summarize your expert witness qualifications? Okay, so I have a uh, bachelor's in in sociology with a minor uh, in uh, criminal. Um, behavior, deviant behavior. I have a master's in social work also with uh, 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 looking at uh, criminal behavior. And then I have a doctorate in education with a uh, focus on gang members, gang membership, gang crimes, and so forth and so on. Okay, Dr. Dela Cruz, do you have any personal insights beyond your professional qualifications? Uh, I do. I was uh, I was a member of gang both in Northern California and Southern California while I was growing up. This is before the North South conflict. Uh, also, I have uh, I, I have uh, been a member of the Nuestra Familia, which is a notorious uh, uh, big prison gang uh, organized crime. Um, I've been a, I was a criminal in addition to that for approximately 30 years of my life. So how long have you been doing the present type of work as an expert witness? The very first time that I did a case was in 19, uh, 1999. Uh, I was, I had just finished, uh, my, uh, no, I, I was just uh, finishing up my uh, my AA, and uh, <clears throat> I did a death penalty case up in in Siskiyou County, where they were alleging that it was a uh, uh, he was a gang member of a uh, a gang they called the Northern California Pecowitz. Um That was approximately twenty twenty one years ago. So how many cases have you actually been involved in? Well, I would say roughly anywhere between 900 and 1,000 cases that I've actually consulted in, right? Uh, you know, so I didn't keep a record, but it's been 20 years, and I'm, uh, I've done a lot of cases, way more than... 700. So I'm thinking anywhere between 900 and 1,000 cases. Are all of these cases California cases? Uh, no, I, I've done cases uh, all over the United States. Actually, I've done cases in, uh, in Chicago, Illinois, in uh, New Jersey, uh, in, uh, in Florida, Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, New Mexico, um, uh, Portland, Oregon, Utah, uh, Kansas City, I mean, not Kansas City, Kansas, state of Kansas, in Wichita, Kansas, um, let me see, and all over California, up and down the state, from San Diego all the way to, to uh, Wairica, Siskiyou County. So you mentioned that you were in a, a, a Mexican gang, or are you limited to testimony on uh, Mexican or Hispanic gangs? No, I'm not limited to that. I'm a, I'm a gang expert. I, 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 you know, I've interacted and researched 
you know, <clears throat> all gangs. So I testified on Asian gangs. I tasted, uh, testified on uh, the blood gangs. I testified on Latin kings. I testified in uh, crip, crip gangs. Uh, I testified in Mala Salvatrucha gangs. Um, you know, north, south. You know, all over. I do gangs in general, uh, even white gangs. The first case I ever did was a white, allegedly a white gang. It sounds like you've been involved in a lot of cases. How many of these cases actually make it all the way to trial? Well, I've only testified a little over a hundred, a hundred times. So, let's say, out of all those cases, about a hundred cases. Have actually gone to trial. The rest of them, as we're uh, as we are very familiar with, uh, usually they plead out. Now, Dr. Dela Cruz, in cases that I personally work with you on, I've noticed that you often testify or give reports indicating that person's not a gang member or that a crime was not committed for the benefit of a gang. It seems that you almost always disagree with the prosecution. Uh, do you have an explanation as to why you disagree so often? Well, <clears throat> number one, you know, uh, we got to understand that, you know, being a police officer is a, is a, uh, is a difficult job, right? Uh, trying to ensure public safety is difficult without, without a doubt. Uh, uh, you know, and, and, and police officers are trying to understand uh, a phenomenon that by its very nature, is <clears throat> secretive and so they look at the gang phenomenon from the outside looking in and so they may you know drive around in a certain area that they have you know uh designated a crime a, a gang area and see these individuals hanging out at the park and they use a certain criteria to designate and document individuals as gang members okay the information that they gather is always gathered from individuals who are what I call incentivized individuals, people that have gotten arrested and, well, you know, to get a, a, a lighter sentence or get released, they provide the, 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 the police officers with information that they want. Not necessarily information that's true, information now that they want now if it fits well why not you know officers don't care you know they're gonna they're gonna use the well i got the information from a former gang member does it mean that it's true not necessarily okay while me I'm, i've been on the inside i know what a gang member looks like what gang members do so when i get involved in a case i get involved in cases where the individual has been accused and charged as being a gang member, but he's not. Now, what are the circumstances behind, you know, that they use? Well, he has tattoos that indicate he has the one, four, or the 13. Those are not gang tattoos, by the way. Those are regional tattoos. Those have nothing to do with gangs. Do gang members have them? Yes. Does it mean that, they're, that it's part of their gang? Absolutely not. What it means is that they align themselves with a certain area, northern or southern California. So, and and then say, well, he was hanging out with, you know, Joe Blow, who's a member of whatever gang, right? Well, Joe Blow may be his cousin, might be his brother, or might be an individual that he grew up with all his entire life, or his next door neighbor, or the kid that lives next, you know, down the block from him. And they're hanging out and they commit a crime and automatically they want to say well it's a gang crime or oh, because why well it's a robbery and gang members commit robberies well robbers commit robberies too you know what i'm saying so that's not a gang crime it's a crime that criminals commit now but so i get involved in cases where they have been accused of being a gang member, but they're actually not. That's why. Not because, you know, I'm pro-gang or I'm pro-crime, but I am pro-justice. 
That's why I get involved in these cases. Okay. So how often are you able to help the defense get gang enhancements or gang charges dropped? You know, I was looking at the past cases that I've been involved in, and uh, it's about 74% of the time where individuals either plead out, right, uh, to a charge without a gang enhancement, or sometimes they take the gang enhancement because, you know, it, it benefits them, you know what I mean? And even though they, they are not gang members, they go, you know, what the hell, you know, I might as well do this, right? Because if not, and if I get convicted, right, then, then I'm going to I'm gonna face a whole bunch of time, right? So we generally win about 74% of the time the gang allegation, not the case itself, uh, although there's been many times where we have won murder cases. You know, the jury has come back and said not guilty. But, of course, I can't take credit for that because, I'm not a lawyer, but I can take credit for assisting the lawyer and <clears throat> developing a, a strategy, a defense strategy that breaks the, in other words, destroys the, the, the argument by the DA that it was a gang crime. And then the jury is able to say, well, wait a minute. It, it, it appears to me that they'll say something like, well, they were not telling the truth about this guy being a gang member, so maybe he's not even guilty of the crime. So, you know, I can take partial credit for that, but we have been very successful in winning a lot of cases, right, in the cases that I've been involved in, where, where they went to the jury. Now, what I can tell you as well is this. Most of the time, not always, but I would say 95% of the time, at least, if you have a gang case and you don't use a gang expert, especially a, 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 a reliable, you know, expert that has tremendous amount of credibility because of his academic, professional, his ability to to uh, testify and, and, and be charismatic, understand and engage the jury, you're going to lose that case because you don't have anyone refuting the testimony by the police gang expert who, you know, is talking about this individual and uh, uh, the monster that he is. If you don't have someone to get understand and humanize that guy, right? To humanize him and explain to the jury exactly and educate them on what a gang member looks like, what gang members do, you know, everything that goes with everything involved in the gang phenomenon to the best of your ability, given the limitations that the court allows, right, then you're going to lose the case. The best thing to do in a case, a gang case, is to set a foundation where you can, you can, you can ask questions and, and get to point Z by asking A, B, C, D, E, F, G, all that, and then you have a good, strong possibility of winning. Uh, Dr. Dela Cruz, how are you normally paid for your expert witness services? There's, there's generally three ways I get paid. One way is the attorney files files a, a 987 declaration to the court, you know, stipulating that this is a gang case, all the points of authority and so forth and so on under the Sixth Amendment, uh, indicating that, you know, the client has, he's indigent, he doesn't have any, uh, he doesn't have the, the funds or the money to be able to hire uh, a, a, a witness, an expert witness on his behalf. So the court, I've never had a court deny a 987 declaration. <clears throat> the other way is, so the county will will pay, you know, for my services. The next, the other way is, if, I, if it's a federal case, because I've done federal cases as well, you know, the state 
For example, in Florida, it's the state of Florida through the Justice uh, Commission. Um, <coughs> anyway, <coughs> hold on. Um, Justice Commission. And then uh, the other way is the, the, the parents or family or somebody related to, you know, the, the defendant can also pay for my services. Uh, when the family has obtain the services of a private attorney um they can the, the attorney can still um submit a, a 987 declaration to the court indicating that the family has no further funds to be able to obtain an uh, expert on behalf of the defendant so there's numerous ways that that it can be done right but that's the way that I get paid. Well, let me let me clarify that. You mentioned 987, and it's my understanding that primarily applies to death penalty, but are you appointed on non-death penalty cases? Oh, yeah. 987 is not, not, I mean, that I know of, I've, I've done many cases where a 987 declaration was was applied, uh, was submitted for non-death penalty cases, but I've done many death penalty cases as well. In fact, I'm doing three of them right now. Okay. Well, thank you for taking my call and uh, allowing me to interview you. Uh, I'll let you know when I uh, upload the video. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you. Okay. We posted an early version of this video on YouTube and we almost immediately started getting questions. So I've called Roger Lampkin on the phone and I'm going to pass those questions on to him and uh, try to get some answers. The first question is, you mentioned that attorney fees should not be excessive or that you must make a showing that attorney fees are not excessive. Could you elaborate on that? Yes. Uh, what the court will look at is uh, reasonable fees based on what's uh, customary in the community, what's charged by other attorneys with sim similar competence and experience and qualifications. Uh, we seldom have any uh, problems with what we charge because compared to other areas like family law, uh, criminal attorneys generally charge with us. Okay, the next question was, you discussed the use of DUI experts. Do you typically get court-appointed experts on DUI cases? Not typically. Normally, uh, a DUI defendant is able to go back to work right away. Uh, the uh, experts don't charge as much as they do in other cases. So the court pretty much uh, looks to the defendant to pay his own way uh, because he normally can afford it. So we don't usually get our experts court appointed on DUI cases. Okay, the third question is, how case specific is the declaration you use in support of request for expert? It must be very case specific. The court is going to want to know that this particular expert is uh, qualified to testify is this on this particular case. So the more detailed you can make uh, the request, and make it case specific, the better. And the final question I've received so far is, I'm not sure what you mean by confidential envelope. Could you elaborate? Yes, that's a simple answer. Just uh, a normal uh, envelope addressed back to the attorney or to the attorney's office marked uh, confidential in big letters so that any clerk will know that it's to be handled confidential and in a confidential manner and uh, would be careful not to let anyone who is unauthorized uh, see it. I am now going to do a phone interview with Alfonso Rivera. Uh, Alfonso, welcome. Could you please uh, tell us who you are and what you do? I'm the uh, founder and CEO for AMR or Advanced Micro Resource Digital Forensics. 
we provide expert consultation, opinions, reports, and testimony in technology cases. Uh, could you please explain what you mean by technology cases? It's really difficult to narrow down to a short answer because there's just so many so much technology out there and we have a virtual army of experts at our disposal. We examine cell phones, computers, social media evidence, cell tower data, surveillance video, and even some more obscure pieces of technology like automobile black boxes and Google location data. In short, we live in a digital world and almost everyone creates digital evidence throughout the day. We examine that evidence and use it to help in criminal, civil, family law, and other types of cases. Well, this course concerns defense experts in criminal cases. How often do you work as experts for the defense? Most of the time, it really is our primary focus. We generally aren't called by the prosecution because they use law enforcement officers as experts. So how do these officers stack up as experts on technology? Some of them are quite good and they have an intuitive grasp of how to find and use digital evidence. Uh, I think that's been my experience also, but I'm, I'm wondering, are these law enforcement officers equal to defense experts? Well, there may be some prosecution technology experts who are highly educated and highly qualified, but the ones we generally see are officers first and experts second. They have usually taken a few technology courses as part of their police training or may have received some hands-on training from fellow officers. But digital evidence doesn't seem to be their primary focus. However, some are becoming very good with digital evidence. Do these uh, officers slash experts give accurate opinions? Oftentimes they, they give opinions that are right on point. Well, uh, your, your use of the word oftentimes gives me some concern. Are the officer opinions accurate on cases with digital evidence? The officer opinions are, of course, limited by their training and experience. But many officers have a good grasp of technology, so their conclusions may be correct. Uh, you seem rather hesitant. May be correct seems to fall far short of beyond a reasonable doubt. Is there something wrong with these officers testifying as experts? There's nothing really wrong with using officers as technology experts. The ones who testify as such experts do have experience and training to qualify them to give them opinions on matters beyond the common understanding of the jury. But in such important matters as deciding a person's fate, something that could mean a lifetime in prison or even worse, I would like to see the officers have more training before testifying as technology experts. All of the experts at Advanced Micro have a minimum of a bachelor's degree in their subject area, as well as many years of experience. It just seems important when trying to decide if a person is guilty of a crime that could send them to prison for life. It isn't like we're dealing with a traffic a ticket or parking violations. Some of these defendants are facing the death penalty. So I'd like to see some sort of real training and expertise before a beat cop is declared as an expert in a complex subject. So is the typical prosecution technology expert qualified? They have qualifications. The court allows them to give an opinion. Well, Mr. Rivera, when it comes to you, I guess I'm not qualified to be a dentist or to squeeze a rock. I just can't seem to pull teeth or get blood out of a stone. You won't condemn the prosecution experts or 
or give information that would qualify them as uh, significant experts. So, so let's move on. Uh, how, <laughs> how are you typically paid for your work on a case? Cases often start with a free consultation. One of our experts will chat with members of the defense team and conduct a cursory overview of the digital evidence. We then outline a scope of work and coordinate with the attorney to get appointed on the case. Are all of your cases court appointed? No, but the majority are. Most defendants can't afford technology experts because of our overhead is so high. Take, for example, the software we use to extract cell phone data. We use multiple extraction and analysis software and hardware packages. But one of the most popular is Celebrate. The minimum cost to get the hardware, software, and certification to use Celebrate is more than $30,000. And that doesn't include the, an the annual fees. We can easily spend a $100,000 or more a year just keeping up with the minimal required hardware, software, and licenses, train and the training required to adequately serve the technology experts. This makes our services cost prohibitive to many of the defendants. You've mentioned cell phones several times. If I give you a cell phone, what evidence can you give me? Well, the question, it, it's way too open-ended, and I hope that no one ever gives me a cell phone and just asks me what the evidence is. A cell phone can have location data that can be used to exclude the user from the crime scene. It can have messages and conversations in multiple formats, such as SMS, Facebook Messenger, Snapchat, WeChat, Instagram, WhatsApp, or any of a dozen other chat programs. It can have pictures taken by the phone's camera, downloaded from the internet, or shared through social media. The phone may store Wi-Fi connection data that shows which routers the phone connected to, and when it can have financial records from PayPal, Venmo, Zelle, or any of a dozen or so additional financial applications. A phone may have even recorded audio or recorded video, and even most mundane applications can have data concerning the user's location, their spending habits, friends, and conversations. For example, few people think to look at the Albertsons Office Depot, Harbor Freight, or Kaiser Permanente applications, but these applications may contain location data, financial information, or in the case of Kaiser Medical Information, there's just so much data on a cell phone, it's hard to describe the evidence we can get from it. Your firm also serves as experts on cases involving audio files, video files, and photographs? Yes. And what do you do on those cases? For the most part, we try to make the recordings easier to hear or see, and we try to find evidence of alteration, inaccuracy, or tampering. For example, if we were to analyze your final slide in this presentation, we would at minimum report that a portion of one of the chairs has been deleted from the slide. If the slide were evidence in a criminal case, it couldn't infer that someone was tampering with the evidence. There's also multiple perspective errors on the slide, but these are matters that a trained eye can simply jump to. Real analysis requires a deeper look under a, using appropriate tools. And I, I must confess, I, I saw the portion of the chair after you pointed it out to me earlier today, and I have not been able to fix that, no matter how I try. I just must not be an expert in, in the use of this software. Okay, can you give me an example of a case where your work did not help the defense? Yes, we recently worked a case that involved some web uh, browsing history. 
and we were able to uh, review some of the reports and also conduct our own independent examination and uh, did confirm that some of the deleted web browsing history was not um, not positive for the defense. In this instance, it prevented the defense from being blindsided uh, with evidence that we uh, proceeded to trial. And I have a question that seems to be recurring in cases, which is how how accurate is cell tower data? And I'm talking about the location data. How how close to a location can you get just using the cell tower data? It really depends. The short answer is that it's more accurate the more rural the area. If there are no significant obstacles for signals to bounce off of and the towers are far apart, we can generally trace a phone's location to the general area around a specific tower. By using a second or third tower to limit the area, we can often narrow the location down to a triangular patch less than the size of a football field. GPS and Wi-Fi can often be used to greatly reduce this area. However, I guess the, the best answer is it depends. If there are many towers and many obstacles that could reflect the signal, it may be difficult to pinpoint a location. So what is 5G and is it going to all give us COVID? <laughs> 5G, there, there's so much uh, misinformation uh, surrounding 5G. Not all 5G is created equal. And so it really does barrier. It really does vary from carrier to carrier. So is it safe to say that it's not going to give us COVID and the earth is actually not flat? That is correct. Okay. And is Facebook a good source of evidence in criminal cases? Well, I hate to give this answer again, but it really depends. So many things have changed with Facebook as it relates to releasing um, location data and even uh, information on the user, their terms of services have, have changed so much just in the last 12 months. But Facebook may have location data, conversations, pictures, videos, and other evidence, but it, it's often extremely unreliable. Facebook, it can be used for multiple devices, so it's common for us to see multiple users on a single Facebook account or for us to see a Facebook account attributed to one owner being used, even if the owner is in custody or otherwise unable to use the account. In wrapping this up, I'll post your contact information on the webpage associated with this, but uh, would you like to give your basic contact information in case anyone would like to give you a call? Sure, uh, we can re be reached directly um, we have emergency service 24 hours a day and even bilingual operators at answer. And the phone number is area code 661-520-9083. Uh, thank you for accepting my call and for taking the time to, to interview uh, for our video.